Raw conversations with creative people. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce you to photographer Eric Kuzno. We're going to talk about his project, Essential Workers, and just hear generally about his life as a creative person. I am your host, Ann Kelly. If this is our first time meeting, you might be wondering who I am. In a nutshell, I'm someone that's been in love with art and music my entire life. I've now been working in the professional gallery world for about 14 years now, and I started Art in the Raw about halfway through 2020 to keep people connected and inspired. I'm excited to introduce you to Eric. Last year was when Essential Workers Project was conceived of center called he emailed me saying they had this idea for a project about photographing essential workers asked if i was interested i said yes well and it was kind of a great project for you in that you'd done a lot of black and white portraits in the past and you were and still are an essential worker yes so you're Mm -hmm. approaching it from the inside being an essential worker, photographing essential workers has helped me approaching businesses, mentioning that I am an essential worker myself, connects us together and it loosens them up. They're not so apprehensive, I guess, of it. like, why are you photographing? Like, oh yeah, you totally understand what it's like. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Right. You're not just some random photographer from the outside. Yeah, I'm not from the New York Times getting paid. You were basically doing it for the love of making photographs and being yeah. a project that resonated with you. Yes. When you started the project, it was completely Santa Fe based. The original idea behind the project is it was going to be a collaboration between Center and I. The original concept was I would go photograph say at the co-op or Whole Foods Center would wheat paste the portraits like on the windows and the sidewalks so people could look at them while they were standing in line. One of the big things was since it was so new, trying to contact these businesses who were trying to figure out what to do. The response was, and I wouldn't say bad, but we just kept on hitting brick walls. You got to talk to this person, that person. They were just shoving it off onto someone else. And after a couple of weeks sitting there waiting and seeing what was going to happen, I was like, how about I just go start photographing and see what happens? I think the first person I photographed was the mailman outside my house. I went up to take out trash and I saw him like sitting on the side of the road across the street. So I ran over to him, explained it to him the best I could. So I run back, grab my camera, run up take a few portraits of him and then he goes on his way especially in the beginning doing this project i had to be in and out of businesses very quickly they were limited to the number of customers they could have within the building so me occupying that space took up a a paying customers the portraits that i had been doing Mm -hmm. when i was just photographing friends in their living environment I was bringing a strobe set up, like just a single strobe, setting that up on a stand. And I really like the the look of flash with portraits. It's my own personal aesthetic. But I knew that doing a complete setup, even if it was one strobe on a stand, would take too long. Right. You needed to be in and out. So I have this really obnoxiously strong ring flash now. Got it from B&H. It had one review. It was a five-star review. And I tried to Google search this ring flash. There was barely anything on it. The instructional videos they had on it were in a different language. And finally, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm buying it. And it pretty much does not leave my camera ever. Buying that flash made my mobility a lot quicker. Each person, like two, three minutes, I would get like, 10 portraits and be done. I was doing speed portraiture. It was 
2020, it was the middle of the pandemic. You're specifically trying to photograph in a time when we're all told to, to stay home and only essential workers are out. Your, your subject is out, but yeah. you, you have a lot of restrictions. Just and getting access to people was problematic, yeah. right? Yeah, that was problematic. And also, the, am I going to get in trouble for being out photographing when there was all these mandates and restrictions? Right. Is, is what you're doing essential, even though you're yeah. an essential worker photographing yeah. the essential workers? But someone did point out, you're not getting paid for this. So I could just be like, yeah, I'm just sorry, taking pictures, I'll leave. Because as an essential worker, did you get one of those cards that you had to put in your car that yeah. stated you were allowed to, to be out driving around? going to work like that was a thing at that yeah, time that, yeah that was definitely a thing I never had to use it those were the times that yeah. were in and you're out looking to photograph people yeah. and as I understand it there was a lot of larger businesses and you were kind of turned away because there was also other larger things going on in the world so you kind of turned yeah. your camera on the mail carrier and other mom and pop businesses that yeah. maybe didn't have as much red tape i found it easier to go to the mom and pop shops because you could just walk in and usually the owner was there and they're like yeah sure yeah I'll photograph the handful of employees be out in like less than 10 minutes usually I would like to go back and try maybe some of the bigger businesses now that I have like a portfolio and they can mm -hmm. see what the project looks like. There's still a lot of small businesses out there that I would rather give them the credit. One thing I found out is like a lot of these small businesses, the, the people felt undermined throughout this mm -hmm. pandemic. The doctors and nurses are getting the media's attention mm -hmm. which is important it is very like i'm not discrediting it at all that was one of the biggest places i got into uh, was saint vincent's hospital here in santa fe that was definitely a lot of red tape before i got the go to photograph in there and, and that was kind of a breaking point for you would you say within the project yeah i contacted one of my friends who she worked at the hospital and my intention was not to get into the hospital i knew she worked in the admin mm -hmm. department i emailed her i'm like hey do you want i'm doing this project could i like photograph you maybe like outside the hospital like at your house and just say this is what you do and she responded with how would you like to photograph the doctors and nurses of the covid unit and i was like um, yeah very much so, please. Mm -hmm. And she got the ball rolling on that. You know, like you said, a lot of red tape. You know, every so often I would get an update saying, hey, we're still working on it. We think we'll get you in on, on this date to be prepared. And then that date would come. They're like, okay, we have to extend it. And it finally did happen one day photographed 19 people in like an hour and a half, like running all over the, not the entire hospital, but I have a liaison, Dominic. So he's my main contact and I have to, I can't leave his side. He was taking me to all these different people to photograph. I think they had scheduled me for three hours. He's like, uh, there you photographed everybody I scheduled for today because I thought it was going to take you longer because that by the time I got to the hospital my efficiency had gotten better I guess with all the small businesses I had been photographing you've been photographing small businesses but then you'd also done a portrait series and then you also had a wedding photography business you, you weren't new to photographing people I do attribute being quick to the wedding photography I did for years. The pandemic did kill that business for me. I could bring it back if I wanted to, but I kind of don't want to. I'm fine with doing my job, my day job, and doing artwork. Like I feel mm -hmm. more fulfilled than doing the wedding photography at this moment in my life. That's the weird thing about life sometimes is maybe the wedding photography business was great for a while and got you by and you made some amazing portraits and you learned from it yeah but maybe you that wasn't exactly what you wanted to do the essential workers project is more in that 
realm that you took from that and yeah you were able to photograph the entire covid unit in mm-hmm. in high quality but in a record amount of time i think it was like late august early september of 2020 that i got to go photograph and we had actually scheduled another shoot because it's like oh there's more people that want to be in your project and we scheduled some i think it was like two three weeks later probably a week before the date that's when it started to spike again they were like sorry we don't have time i was like i completely understand and i'm still in contact with those people i kind of the origin of your project all occurred with in santa fe and during that time was featured in buzzfeed and in our local paper in santa fe and made it to your hometown newspaper Then you went home to Michigan, where you're from originally, and you continued the project there. So it has had its Santa Fe roots in Michigan. The idea of going back to Flint to photograph this project pretty much happened almost instantly, like when I started the project in 2020. But because of all the travel restrictions, it just wasn't feasible. And then my kids were in school at the house. I would stay with them during the day, make sure they got their school work done. And then I would go to work. I think it was like with six weeks left of the school year, kids were allowed back into the school. So that shifted everything in my life as well. I think we finalized the trip, solidified the dates probably like two, three months before I left. My boss was really nice in the fact that like I got an extended leave of absence fairly easy. Well, your job was already familiar with the project, what you were yeah. working on. It's Everybody at my store is all for the project. The, the head manager of the store, they're all for it. They've helped me as much as possible. They knew how, how important it was to me to do the project. But you had a little more access in, in Michigan. You actually emailed me or messaged me saying you, you had extended what your idea of what the essential worker was. And I didn't know how much access I was going to get to certain places until I actually got there. It's all thanks to my dad, who Mm -hmm. probably like six, eight years ago, decided to get into local politics because he wanted to. He started off in Clio, and then he became Genesee County Commissioner. That's where he met a lot of the people that I met Why I was there. He's like, yeah, I'll introduce you to a, a few people. And then you kind of got to take it on your own. I'm like, all right, cool. It's a door. And as right. soon as I arrived, he's like, okay, I got you this person, this person. We're doing this, that. It was like having a personal assistant, like telling me what my schedule was of shooting. It was pretty awesome. Anything he asked me, I was like, that the answer is going to be yes. Please. There were a few places that he he did contact that they did say no, but majority of the people were all for it. In 30 days, I did 250 portraits, 250 different people. You know, some days I only did two portraits. One day I did 40 portraits in like somewhere around an hour. And that was at this place called GC Carts, the local food bank and also Meals on Wheels in Flint. Mm -hmm. They had two sides of the building one was like where they pack it like all the canned goods and handed out boxes like they had this drive up system where people would just drive up they would hand them a box of food and they would take off and then the other side of the building is where they prepared all the meals for meals on wheels so in one hour i got led through both buildings they had everybody fill out the model release form before i got like i emailed it and they filled it out you expanded the project there. It went from just trying to get in the door anywhere to just having full on access. The kids and I and the two dogs took three days to drive from Santa Fe to Michigan. We arrived, I think, on a, I want to say a Tuesday night at around midnight. I hit the ground running. The Genesee County Sheriff's Office is on the first floor of the county jail. I was in the cell blocks photographing corrections officers. Everything that happened, like I didn't know what I was actually getting myself 
into. I was just told this is where I had to be. Whoever wants to be photographed can be photographed. It was total volunteer. Bosses didn't pressure their employees to be photographed. They would explain the project or I'd explain the project. I think within the first week or two that I was there, the mask mandate got lifted. At first, it kind of bothered me because I, what's the word I'm looking for? A cohesive, like everybody wearing a mask in the portrait. And I was like, okay, maybe this is better. This is showing the project evolving. At the beginning, all these pictures, they had to have the mask on. Now we're at a point where it's optional. This whole thing's still kind of changing and evolving and yeah, we'll know we're, more tomorrow. We're back to having to wear masks. So when you first started this project, you had this vision of wheat paste and that got set to the side because you were just really trying to find people to photograph. Is the vision of wheat paste still on the table? I haven't really contacted or talked to anybody from Center about bringing that back around. It's definitely not off the table. It's just it had its original idea. The original idea was not working as well as we had thought it would. There were other artists that were actually doing something similar because you know art galleries were, were not allowed to be opened so people were doing outdoor installations just to do art what is center's role or has it just become eric run with it type of thing it just became eric run with it uh, so you're now represented by foreman concept gallery yeah. in santa fe new mexico yeah. if anybody wants prints that's where they should go at, at foreman concept yes mm -hmm. And every year I volunteer at Review Santa Fe for Center. I have gotten a handful free reviews for my work as a volunteer. Not every year something happens, but the American Motel, one year I got into Wired mm -hmm. Magazine, the online publication. 2018, I was working as a volunteer in the actual review room and Melanie was running the show. She took, She's like, hey, Jordan from Foreman Concept. He doesn't have anybody to review. You should go to show him your work. I knew of Foreman Concept. All I had was the Motel series. He was more excited about my work than I have ever been in my entire life. That experience with him and what he saw in my work put life back into like me wanting to do photography outside of weddings, getting paid for it. He's like, I have this concept for a show and I want the He's like, your work is perfect. And I want this group show to be centered around your work. I was like, what did you just say? And I could tell he was like really sincere. But at the same time, I'm like, okay, this guy's probably never, I'm never going to hear from him again. And we have definitely formed, you know, professional relationship. The show that I was going to be in was slated to be October 2020. Of course, it didn't happen. But like new projects have come about and he's done, I think, two studio visits, like come over and sat and looked at my work, talked about it. And I really have a lot of respect for Jordan. I think he just, he lives and breathes art. And then when the Essential Worker Project came about, the focus switched from my motel series to the Essential Worker Project. I've sold artwork here and there in the past. To date, Foreman Concept has done my biggest sale. They sold eight pieces to St. Vincent's Hospital of the work photograph there. And the pieces are hanging in the main lobby of the hospital. They're supposed to be permanently there. Uh, kind of dig in the captain. You'd mentioned to me earlier you've acquired this piece a number of years ago and you've held on to it. Yeah, it, it, it has followed me to many different locations that I've lived throughout Santa Fe. I won it at a white elephant Christmas party. I can't remember the exact year, but I want to say it was probably 2009-2010. Do you have other artwork that you've acquired? I've done trading with people throughout the years, mostly photographers. I have a lot of Anto earlier pieces. When him and his wife got married, mm -hmm. uh, they just had a small ceremony. I 
photographed it for him. He's like, how much do I owe you? I was like, uh, can I have some prints? I think he gave me like 10 prints from the series he did in the Oklahoma panhandle. Mm -hmm. So I had, yeah, 10 prints from that. I have a new book that I think came out this year. I don't know if you've seen it. I'll have to buy one. And then I have one piece that's hanging up over there. Jesse photographed this neighborhood, I think, in Arizona where they go all out for Christmas. I met him at PhotoFest in Houston and we traded prints. The one that I got from him is like probably the most simple one. It just says happy birthday Jesus on top of the roof and part of it has fallen over so it just says happy birth Jesus. What about other things you collect? I have a record collection but I haven't bought records in probably 10 years or more. I guess I collected my children's happiness. I own a lot of Pokemon cards. That's my money that bought them. Oh, okay. I do collect photo books, uh, not as much as I used to. I got a lot of free signed books when I worked at the Andrew Smith Gallery. I think the last one I bought was Steve Fitch's Finishing Vernacular. My prize is a signed edition of Eggleston's 5x7. Nice. I think I have number 23 of 150. It was back in the day when Maggie and Jonathan mm -hmm. used to work there. I used to go like just hang out and bug them all the time. Most of the time I would just go there to buy the damaged books. I'm like, mm -hmm. what a book for five bucks? Fuck yeah, that's what I'm doing today. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't care about the condition. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I walked in one day and 5 by 7 had just come out mm -hmm. and the majority of it had already been sold. They had like two or three copies that I don't know why they didn't sell. Like, can I buy it? They're like, yeah, 150 bucks. I'm like, here, out of all the signed books, like getting Eggleston to sign a book is like trying to pull teeth. Right. Like he doesn't really do it. But last I checked two, three years ago, I think on ebay the five by seven sign goes for like eight or nine hundred dollars there's certain things i know because of working at the gallery i'm like oh shit i have to buy that so yeah when it comes to collecting maybe you're not like collecting everything but yeah you, you have that know-how I mean, when i worked at the andrew smith gallery there was at one point in one room we had four different prints of moonrise over hernandez mm -hmm. we had I think it was the second or third ever printed version of it. So it was like 1941, 1942 when it was printed. Like you can see so much of the clouds. It's not, the sky is not black. And you just see this progression from 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And they're all drastically different as his vision of that photograph changed. I like the idea of open edition way better than closed edition. And I've had discussions with other photographers and people in the gallery system about edition prints and how, depending on what level you're at as an artist, does it really matter making an edition print? Because, okay, say me, for example, I print two different sizes. Now the smaller size, edition of 10, larger size, edition of five. So say I make two prints of this one because I only print to order I'm not going to make 10 prints of one thing I don't have the money for that so say I make two prints and I addition it one of 10 or one of five or you know whatever and then I die I'm not alive to sign make more of the addition prints so it seems kind of pointless making something a limited edition there's supposed to be 10 of them but 10 never got made and that's almost more common when limited editions were a new thing and photographers were claiming, oh, we'll all only do 50, yeah. right? Because at the time, 50 seemed like a smaller amount and most of those photographers didn't print 50. It helps ease people's fear of what if I buy this thing for X number of dollars and the photographer prints 90,000 prints of it. Like yeah. they don't want that. So it makes them feel a little bit better that there's only 10 or five or 20 or 50 or, or whatever. There, there ends up only being one. Right, yeah. exactly. Thinking of the open editions and also people that are the masters of photography, they only have a handful of prints that most people know. 
working at the Andrew Smith Gallery, like I learned a lot about that and the fact that I didn't even know that Ansel Adams had shot in color at one point in his life. Right. I, saw, I saw a color print of his. I was like, what the hell is this? Like, is this right. Elliot Porter trying to be Ansel Adams? Because I could see the style. And he's like, no, Ansel is an Ansel Adams print. He did some color and he didn't like it. So he stopped. And then you got Lee Freelander. Pretty much anything he prints sells. So I guess that doesn't really matter. But his most famous photo is his shadow with the woman in the fur coat that's his bread and butter right there everybody wants to buy that print when i was working for andy I, lee had stopped printing from a certain decade like he's like i will only print something from 1990 and on or whatever it was mm -hmm. so now you officially cannot get those old prints like a new print of it i grew up in a household too, where collecting was not a huge thing. It was more about experiences than mm -hmm. anything else. From this past year, is there a particular experience in making photographs that really just stand out to you? Going to Michigan and be able to do this project in my home state, you know, the county that I grew up in, that was really important experience to me. Backtracking of to why I wanted to do it in Flint, in the news, you hear nothing but bad things about Flint, the water crisis. Anytime I tell people that I'm from that area, they're like, oh, how's the water thing? Going? I'm like, I don't know. Bad, I guess. So one of the things I wanted to focus on the essential workers there is to show the positive things that are actually happening in Flint. It's not like this lost city that everybody thinks it is. The whole Roger and me thing. That's another reference people have is Michael Moore's movie from the late 80s about GM leaving. That was three, four decades ago. So things have changed. Uh, I was photographing this uh, nonprofit place called Latinx. They actually had one of those like, water systems that Will Smith's son makes or gave it to, to them. And, you know, I was standing outside with them and people were pulling up to get fresh water because the water's still not great in Flint. But I was talking to him and this gentleman came up and he was just telling me about the people of Flint. Like there's this like resilience, like it's a town where people like they constantly are like getting beaten down but they don't give up there's mm -hmm. so much positive outlook to rebuild their community even though it's just been bad for decades it's just meeting people that were like yeah we're doing this and this and this is happening that's amazing which is going to segue i think into another project that i'm going to do just on flint itself in the future one of the people that i met through the connections my dad had is Representative Neely and her husband, Mayor Neely, Mayor of Flint. I'm hopefully going to work with her photographing what's going on in Flint, the projects that they're doing to make change for a better community. So Representative Neely and Mayor Neely, I asked, and they're like, where do you want to photograph them? I'm like, their office, they maybe like, a project that they had worked on to improve Flint, like outside, like a building or like in a whatever they did. Yeah. How about at their? We'll do their house. I was like, what? Like they're inviting me to their personal home. In my head, like you know, I'm photographing the mayor of Flint. I'm expecting to go to a house, like a gated house. Like there's a guard at the door or at the gate. Like he's gonna have to like check me in or whatever. You know, they give me the address to go to and I'm driving, I'm driving through Flint and they live in a normal neighborhood, it's a house that they raised their kids in. It was definitely not what I was expecting. I was expecting, since he's like the mayor of Flint, like a major, a big city, if you will. Oh my gosh, he's like the most like kind of humble. He didn't become mayor and then like move out of the city into like a big mansion. Yeah, I arrived a little bit early. When I knocked on the door, this guy in a truck was like, is the mayor home? And I'm like, 
I, 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 I'm first time here. I don't even know if I have the right house, but <laughs> according to you stopping and yelling at me, I'm probably at the right place. But when I went in, you know, I was talking to Representative Neely and I, as I saw him pull up, he knew the shoot was happening. Before he came in, he, that guy had waited out there. He went and talked to that guy for like 10 minutes, some guy that lived in his neighborhood. I was like, that is, that is really cool. Like you are a person of the people like that you represent. It's not beneath you to come home and have someone in your neighborhood wanting to talk to you and you go talk to them. That's cool. When he came in, he who what that I was there to photograph. He didn't know why. He didn't know what the project, anything other than the fact. So he's, you know, grilling me and I can tell he's like, really like on the defense like trying to figure out what i'm doing what it's for Mm -hmm. how it's going to be used and i understand that because when you're a politician you got a public image to maintain and am i a paparazzi photographer he's like how did you get connected with us and i started i was like well my dad martin kuzna he's like you're marty's boy he's like well I'm going to go change and we'll get like it just like saying my dad's name, all guard was pretty much down. I didn't know how much work my dad had done. It was just a cool moment. Where that went from the beginning of the project. That is huge. Yeah. I photographed them two days before I left. So it was like the very end. So it was like a really nice high note. I think the next day I photographed the MTA and that, that was when I was done. The last picture that I actually took, this woman, she had this mask on that I think is a not today. Mm-hmm. When I photographed her, Harmony, who is a liaison, like mm-hmm. taking me everywhere. She's like, is there anything, anybody else, anything else you want to photograph? And like in my head, like that picture of like with that mask, on, I was like, no, I think I'm done. I, I think this is like a good spot to like end this part of the project on. For now. For now. now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that stint. Yeah, you had mentioned that you just felt like it was kind of endless, the project there. Like when I left, it had been a month Mm -hmm. and I just felt like I was at that point just getting traction, really getting going into the project. And I have my responsibilities. This is how projects work. You do what you can with the time you have. But you have roots there and connections there. And now I have more connections and you know as i'm editing these photos i'm doing my best to at least email people a a digital copy of it that's the main reason i have the model releases is so i have the person's name the place they work at and their contact information Mm -hmm especially photographing that many people, I'm not going to remember everybody's name. I photographed the MTA, the mass transit in Flint. All these people that had to work, they felt so appreciated that I was coming in to actually photograph them and make them part of this larger project and show appreciation for what they're doing. And it was, and it's not just all about doctors, nurses. There's like this huge collection of people that are essential to make society work. This is just one example, and I'm sure there's more that I'll find. When I was photographing at a vaccination site, you know, I was photographing all like these nurses and that were volunteering there. And I saw this man and woman just sitting there. Like it, it was a slow day because a lot of people had already been vaccinated and it was like slowing down. At first I thought they were there to get vaccinated. And they were sitting and waiting. But after a while, I was like, those people are still there, but I don't know what they're doing. So I finally, I went up to the woman. I was like, hi, uh, are you working here? She's like, yeah, I'm a translator. I'm like, translator? She's like, yeah, uh, for the Spanish speaking people. majority of the doctors and nurses here don't know how to speak Spanish. Being here in New Mexico, where majority of people are bilingual, you don't think of needing a Spanish translator at a vaccination site. She's like, yeah, I've been working the entire pandemic. Did not think of that one. And I'm sure there's more that I haven't thought of that will arise at some point. When I was photographing the bus drivers, there was like three different departments. We went downtown to get the big buses we get to the downtown center in flint 
we meet up with the guy that runs that. He's like, all right, I think we have some people, but the bus is like, we have to catch them at these times because they all come in, they all leave at pretty much the exact same time. Mm -hmm. It was like really busy and then it's quiet. And I just remember one guy, they're like, hey, can we take your picture? And this guy just like very animated. He's like, no, no, no. I was like, in my head, I was like, all right, dude, you could have just said no. But I should have, wait, this is public property. I should have just like, shot him because it would have been an amazing photo of him like trying to block right but also like with this I'm trying to be as respectful as I can be of the people that I'm photographing because this is it's also portrait photography it's not I'm not doing street photography I guess it's a portrait project I'm not gonna just shove a camera in someone's face without their permission you're not a paparazzi even though I get called that all the time even though Santa Fe is a place for celebrities come and hang out Mm -hmm. i've actually had run-ins where i i've had my camera on me what i'm like "Eh, you're not paying me i'm not photographing you so santa fe new mexico you've lived here for a minute red or green chili what is your favorite usually green but at posas one of my favorite breakfast burritos and i always get red I like their red better than their green. I think that's the only place I get red chili. And green is just everywhere else? Pretty much, yeah. It's a New Mexico thing. Occasionally, I do get Christmas when I'm feeling a little wild. Let's do both. If, um, you were advising Eric, as in you, back in, say, maybe 2001, You're an artist walking out of the College of Santa Fe. Do you have advice for yourself or other artists? The one thing I wish they would teach in art schools is more like the business Mm -hmm. aspect. I learned a lot at the College of Santa Fe. I don't regret my education, but when I started doing wedding, figuring out how to run a business as a photographer, that's hard. I would advise people want to do it as a career. I would take business classes. I don't know necessarily at the tip, maybe get your degree and then go to the community college and take a few business courses so you can figure out how to run a functioning art business, whether it's painting, sculpture, photography. That's great advice. Maybe double major, art and business. I don't I don't think you physically could do that unless you just didn't sleep but you know that's the thing about it too you gotta have some sort of level of resilience but if you want to do any art form like you gotta be able to handle rejection i know a lot of people that i'm not gonna name names but like people that I graduated with that I thought were amazing at what they did, whether it's photography, sculpture, painting, they're not involved in the arts whatsoever on any level. They're like, yeah, yeah, I work in Wall Street or whatever. Like, Mm -hmm. huh. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I put groceries on a shelf and I still take pictures. And I hope one day that my work gets recognized. They're like, you still take pictures? I'm like, yeah. Do you do anything else? No, not really. Like you just got to keep doing it because you have to. For me, I feel better. I have really bad depression. Like if I'm not doing something artistic, which is primarily just photography for Mm me, my mood is shit. I have to be creating something because I have to. For the love of the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm 44 years old, and I think my career as like an art photographer is now finally starting to take off. And I do attribute it to Center, volunteering there, and like just getting to network, meeting Jordan, and like someone actually having faith in what I'm doing or seeing something in it. I spent thousands of dollars going to PhotoFest. Four days of showing my work. Nothing ever came out of that. What's the one in New Orleans called? Photonola. That one was a good one. Nothing like huge came out of it, but I did make some connections there that other things came out of. If a photographer is going to do these reviews, I think the smaller, more intimate ones are better. PhotoFest was just a shit show for me. 
not saying that it's bad. It's huge and there's a lot of people involved and it goes on for weeks. I would like to do Odo Lucida someday. I just haven't had the finances. Being able to be connected with Center and even though I'm not getting a fully reviewed, like I'm at least making connections with people and long-standing relationships. Well, that's what it's about, forming those relationships. So yeah, that would be another thing. Like if you live in a general vicinity of a review, whether it's in New York or Portland, LA, offer to volunteer. The first few years that I know that I did volunteered at Center, it wasn't like huge things happened, but the snowball effect, I guess, started happening. I would have to like fill out this form and say, I want to volunteer. But after a while, they would contact me saying, hey, we need your help again. Are you available? And I take work off to do it. Not only are positive things happening from doing it, I actually really enjoy going and not just meeting these people that are gallery owners, museum directors, and but I every year I get to see all these photographers and see their work, like walk through the room and just kind of like peek and be like, oh, that person's work's cool. I should look them up. So do you have any shout outs, anything you want to mention about the project, people that have contributed? Laura, People Running Center, that's the main reason this project happened. My friend Hannah at St. Vincent's for getting me in the door. Little Dominic, Kathy, who are the two liaisons, if they headed getting me into the hospital. Also, Jordan at forming concept and for now thank you eric for being on okay. art in the raw thank you ann we'll talk to you soon maybe there'll be yeah. an update or something thanks for watching art in the raw conversations with creative people if you enjoyed meeting eric please consider subscribing and letting like-minded friends know have a good night and i'll see you next week Take three. Welcome, Eric. <laughs> you know, I'm nervous because of all the thunder and lightning. Mm, me too.